I was initially very reluctant to take on the challenge of this talk. You might ask why. Because I'm both unused and uncomfortable to talking about anything to do with myself. Yet I can speak with ease on just about any subject in the line of my life's calling, media in all its manifestations, whether it is independent media, ethics, democracy, press freedom, and I've done so often. So why the reticence? I've had to dig deep within myself to try and find out why I am reluctant to speak personally. I've never given myself the time, nor the luxury really, of introspection in the past, but perhaps that time is now. I know one thing, and this may serve as an explanation of sorts. Back in the day, I was always closely watched. As an activist, journalist under apartheid, I had no privacy, not in my personal life, even less so in my work. The police, security, intelligence services of the South African regime, call them what you will, knew more about me than I knew myself. My phones were tapped, my mail was read, my movements monitored, and my friends were watched. In order to deal with this ever-present intrusion, I think I depersonalized myself to a very large degree to keep fear at bay, seldom sharing, hardly ever trusting, wanting to protect those around me because the more they knew, the greater the danger I placed them in. I was mostly my own confidant and advisor, and internalizing all this over the years has made me the way I am today. I think it's a pretty good reason, and I hope that helps explain, but I digress. It's not my story that I want to tell anywhere. That story spans decades and is very familiar to many people in my circles. Instead, it's that which lies behind it, the why of it all, that I want to talk about this evening. What I call my Rosa Parks moment, my daughter calls my aha moment. You all know who Rosa Parks was, and if you don't, she was a woman who epitomized the US civil rights movement when she refused to give up her seat on a whites-only bus. 1966, South Africa, Cape Town. Myself as a young schoolgirl, just 13, traveling home on a crowded public bus. In those days, they were segregated, whites sat downstairs, and blacks were upstairs. An elderly black woman, very frail, climbed with great difficulty up the three or four steps into the bus laden with parcels. And as I say, you could see she was struggling. I was sitting at the front of the bus, and I immediately got up and gave her my seat. When that happened, my fellow white passengers exploded with abuse towards the two of us. I felt a hot surge of anger take hold of me. It was as if a lightning bolt had struck me to the core, especially when I saw the hurt in her eyes. In that instant, my life changed, and my conscience was awakened, and my passion was ignited. I resolved then never to stay silent in the face of injustice in general and the oppressive reality that was apartheid oppression in particular at that time. Fast forward some years, and I come to the crossroads between youth and adulthood. Choices. How to make the right one to give effect to my promise. I briefly mulled joining the armed struggle, but no, guns were not my thing. How best, then, to try to tackle the scourge of apartheid and racism? Activism? I'd done my share as a student, tear-gassed on the steps of the University of Cape Town and being beaten up at protests. Or journalism? Or both? Both. Why couldn't they be combined? And if so, where could I make the most difference? Then, Southwest Africa, a mandate which became a colony of South Africa. Change must come there sooner than in South Africa itself, surely. The die was cast, and in 1976, my Namibian journalistic journey began. 
The rest is history. I made it up as I went along because I had no formal training in journalism or in the craft in general. I was driven by activism, by passion, and by journalism. An exciting, powerful, if complex combination. I too could do many things then. Inform the voiceless people of Namibia of what was happening around them. Advocate the self-determination and independence of the country. Expose the injustices of institutionalized racism and the cruelties of this inhumane system. And also to try to change white thinking about their black compatriots. Most people equate journalism with objectivi objectivity or neutrality. I don't now, and I never did. While our writing needs to be fair and balanced, it is absolutely imperative that we take sides in what we choose to cover if we care and connect with the communities we live in. How can we be impartial, read passive, in the face of poverty, neutral about corruption, ambivalent about cruelty and excess, dismissive of suffering and exploitation. Walter Lippmann put it very well when he said nearly a century ago and equated journalism to, and I quote, a beam of a searchlight that moves restlessly about, bringing one episode and then another out of darkness and into vision. If we are distant and detached about these things, perhaps we don't care enough, and we risk losing the interests of our readers, viewers, and listeners. Sky TV's Alex Crawford put it very well recently when she said that journalists are designed to challenge, to push, to dig, to question, to irritate, to run towards danger and confrontation rather than away from it. I would add that Above all, it is to try and make a difference to the world as we know it, and this requires a passionate and focused mindset. Workaholism is part of that passion, and work is not work, and you don't count the hours when you love what you do. It is not, and it shouldn't be, about money or fame or public recognition. It is often an unrewarding and thankless task especially for those journalists who are quite literally in the firing line. It should be something you choose to do, and to do so with love, honor, and a sense of responsibility because you believe you can make a difference. And if this difference is not always quantifiable, at least you can be said to have tried. But back to the incident on the bus, which raises the question about a broader social conscience not only within the journalism fraternity. Why did I stand up on that bus to give that elderly woman a seat? Was it fear that present, prevented other whites from standing to do so? Were they all bad people, brainwashed? Or was it simply the way they saw the world, choosing not to get involved or to ask the questions that might or would cause them discomfort? We can pose the same questions with regard to the inaction that is fairly pervasive in the face of various injustices we face across the world today. Good journalism can and does change the way people see their world. It can lead them to question authority, hold governments to account, expose lies, or simply just to bear witness. I would love to give you tons of examples of where it has made a difference, but the time constraint this evening won't allow me to do so. But only those who really love what they do can do it well. And the scores of journalists who've died in the exercise of their craft or who are in jail on our continent and worldwide bears testimony to the fact that there are still those who care enough to make a sacrifice for the good of their communities and their world. And while once the media was the almost exclusive prevail of journalists. The rise of new media, social and otherwise, has meant that citizens the world over, who never before had access or opportunity, now have the means to raise their voices for the betterment of their communities and humanity in general. And they can have a global voice, but they can also choose to throw away the opportunity to make this difference 
and connect. I would make a call to action for all of us, especially the youth, to use this opportunity to speak both wisely and well. Making a stand against injustice does demand that people abandon their comfort zones. It can mean danger and sacrifice, material loss, and sometimes even risk to others close to them. When I was pregnant in detention without trial many years ago, unwilling to release the source of certain published information, many people condemned me for risking the health and safety of both myself and my child my daughter. But I was fighting, not just for myself and my daughter, but for the us, for all Namibians, even those blinded by propaganda, needed a light to see. I wondered at the time, sitting in jail, what my daughter, when grown, would think. But fortunately, she, now 25, fully supports my, my decision and says she would happily have been born in jail to protect freedom of speech. For too many people, I think personal safety for themselves and their families, the reluctance to get involved, may seem like a very good reason not to try to make a difference or to fight injustice or to do what some might construe as interference. But I feel that at some point, if you do not do so, the very things that you hold dear might be threatened too. And I am reminded here of the oft-quoted Pastor Martin Niemöller, whose poem, that if you fail to speak out for others, there will one day be no one left to speak for you. Apartheid in Southern Africa is thankfully now a relic of the past. But does that mean we can sit back and say we've achieved our goals for a just and equitable society? I know that none of you out there really believe that we have realized these ideals fully? So should we put aside activism and return to our objective little comfort zones, thinking only of ourselves? Should we turn a blind eye to suffering and wrongdoing, not only in Namibia, but further afield in our increasingly divided and unequal world? No, I think the clarion call must go out to more and not less people to get involved at all levels. I chose journalism to forge the way to a rights-based society, and ultimately, I hoped, a better world. You, or many of you, have not and may not have taken the same path I did, but through passion and connectivity and intense subjectivity about the kind of world we want to live in, you too can choose to help forge a good society in order for real democracy and justice to prevail. The task is way too big to be left to journalists alone. To choose passion for positive change and a cause greater than oneself is an idea worth spreading. Quite literally, as a journalist said over a hundred years ago, our task should be to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. And while I've moved on now from the adrenaline rush of daily journalism, I continue to promote the ideals of press freedom, free press, and access to information worldwide, whenever the opportunity presents itself. That which we take for granted is still denied to many people the world over. It is also important, I feel, to plant those seeds of passion in young journalists who will hopefully, in turn, inspire others through commitment to high standards, ethics, professionalism, and independent and selfless reporting to do the same. I wouldn't be true to the ideals that I hold very dear as a journalist of many decades standing if I did not take this opportunity to pay tribute to those brave journalists on our continent and the world over who've paid and who continue to pay the price simply, as someone once said, for committing the act of journalism. And although she's long gone now, my heartfelt thanks go to the little old lady on the bus many decades ago who awoke my conscience and showed me the way. My guest seat is empty tonight because symbolically that seat belongs to her. I thank you. <laughs> 